Hi, everyone. We're going to head into chapter six, which will continue our discussion about SN1 and SN2 reactions. This is just going to focus on both types of reactions and kind of the rules for those mechanisms. So to start, a reminder that these substitution reactions, SN1, remember, is a nucleophilic substitution or substitution nucleophilic. That's what the SN stands for. <clears throat> and we talked about and introduced both types of nucleophilic substitution, um, the SN1 version and the SN2 version. And remember that the difference between SN1 and SN2, as far as the mechanism is concerned, is that SN1 has these two steps, excuse me, right here, two steps in which its leaving group exits slowly, and then the new additional group, in this case, this is a, a halide, enters and then forms the product. In an SN2 reaction, both occur at the same time. <clears throat> so you have one full slow step in which both the leaving group leaves and then you have the addition of your new um, molecule, in this case, again, a halide. So SN1, this happens, this is a unimolecular, meaning that Again, one molecule is moving at a time. So you see one, one molecule. And then the SN2 is a bimolecular. That's the two, both happening at the same time. Now we talked about these in the context of alcohols. And if you remember last time, we talked about changing an alcohol on a group so if this is some group with an alcohol on it, generally changing it so that it has a halide on it. Remember, we used X to represent a halide. But this could be something like bromine or chlorine, any halide, right? So we looked at it in this context. And I did tell you, a uh, reminder, that you can also react halides in other ways. And we'll be talking about that today, but remember we talked about taking alcohol and making an alkyl halide using either an SN1 or an SN2. And water was our leaving group. Now alkyl halides and other things called pseudohalides, generally alkyl halides can also undergo the same analogous process with a different nucleophile. What I mean is you can start with an alkyl halide. Instead of in our past examples, we talked about taking an alcohol and making it an alkyl halide. We can also take an alkyl halide and it will act as an electrophile and react it with a nucleophilic agent. And in this case, we would get a new type of substitution, a new type of nucleophilic substitution, which would result in the removal of our halide. So again, just, just to clarify, these are both nucleophilic substitution reactions, both types of nucleophilic substitutions reactions. In this example, we just started with an alcohol and we react it with a Remember, we acted with a uh, acid, an acid halide, to then make an alkyl halide. Here we're talking about starting with an alkyl halide. We're going to react with some other nucleophile, and you can make a new product by removing the halide. Again, both valid types of substitution, just understand. Don't get confused because alkyl halide is starting here, where in the other case it was a product. 
It just depends on what you're starting with, how strong your reagents they are, um, what your products will be, right? So the key here is to understand what are nucleophiles and what are electrophiles. We talked a lot about these and remember I said that understanding this kind of uh, Lewis acid base theory and nucleophiles and electrophiles is going to be very important for this class because it will really help you understand how reactions are being driven. So in these substitution reactions, you'll typically see nucleophiles as metal salts. Um, what I mean by that is usually there will be some type of metal like lithium, potassium, or sodium, and it will be attached to a variety of organic or inorganic ions. So it could be attached to a alkoxide group. This is an OR. That would be something like OCH3. Um, our car a carboxylate. This R again could just be like CH3, C, O, and this, this side, the negative side would be where the salt is hanging out. We could have a hydrogen sulfide group. This is an SH minus group, a cyanide group. CN minus group or an azide group, for example, this is three nitrogens, N3, and this has a general minus charge on it. Now, these could be attached to any variety of our metals listed above. For example, you could have a sodium alkoxide, like shown, or you could have a lithium carboxylate or a potassium hydrogen sulfide, potassium sulfide, any combination of these. <clears throat> Again, the, the salts are ions, right? We talked about what an ion is. They can separate into a positive and negative charge. So the salt part is just kind of hanging out there. It's not generally <clears throat> participating in the reaction. Although our nucleophilic end, the anion end, is the part that's usually participating. So here's an example, the same formula I showed you before for a general nucleophilic substitution, but I filled in potential um, electrophiles and nucleophiles you could see based on what I just talked about. So again, we have an alkyl halide as our electrophile. This is the one accepting the electrons. So here's an example, alkyl halide. This is um, methyl bromide, right? Or um, bromomethane, one bromomethane would be the correct name here. And then it's reacting with this sodium cyanide. That was an example of one of the nucleophiles salts that you might see. <clears throat> so based on our reaction above, you can see that the product would be that our cyanide group is going to attack the electrophile at the carbon. It'll break this bond, releasing the bromine. And what we result is, when we result in is now a new attachment, attachment, right? We substituted, this is a substitution reaction. We have our cyanide directly attached to the methyl group as our product. And the sodium and the bromine, this, they're both positive and negative charge, so they form a salt. But we can write them as their ion forms because in solution, they're generally thought of as just ions. So this is just an example you might see for a type of nucleophilic substitution. Now some rules about the electrophile. Again, back here, this is our alkyl halide in our example. 
The electrophile is going to contain a carbon attached to some type of leaving group. That's what the LG here stands for, leaving group, right? It's going to be the group that is substituted. It's going to leave. And it must have bond polarization towards the leaving group. So what you'll see is that what I mean is you have your dipole moment with the negative charge towards whatever our leaving group is. This is key to having a good electrophile. And that's because we want the carbon group, whatever the carbon group is that's attached to this leaving group to be partially positive. Remember, this is the electrophile, it is the thing accepting electrons. So we want electrons to go to the carbon, which is positive, and then kick off our partially negative leaving group. So alkyl halides are good and common electrophiles in this reaction. Now another key thing about the electrophile is that the carbon must be sp3 hybridized. sp3 hybridized. That is a carbon that is only making single bonds. That's key, single bonds. So if you see a carbon, for example, here, this is a carbon that is involved in two single bonds, but also a double bond. This is sp2 hybridized. This one here, this carbon here as well, it's involved in two single bonds, but also a double bond. It is also sp2 hybridized. You could also have, for example, something like this, this carbon. We actually looked at cyanide earlier. Cyanide makes a good nucleophile, it does not make a good electrophile. This carbon right here is S P hybridized, so it also could not participate as a electrophile in a substitution reaction. So be on the lookout if you see a question where it asks, you know, which one of these groups would be a good, good uh, for this particular reaction, and you see that it has a double bond or a triple bond, you know that that cannot participate in this type of substitution reaction because our carbons have to be sp3 hybridized. Now this is the carbon that is reacting as the electrophile. Can there be a double bond in general on the molecule? Yes, there can. But the area that is acting as the electrophile, the area that has the leaving group on it, that carbon has to be sp3 hybridized. So remember, um, in a nucleophilic substitution, the leaving group is what accepts the electrons, just like an acid. We're comparing these a lot to our acids and bases, right? The nucleophile is like the base. It's going to um, be giving the electrons and the electrophile is like the acid. It's going to be accepting electrons. So generally, because of this pairing, good leaving groups are usually also associated with strong acids. Um, if you want to just compare, if you remember the trends of strong acids, you can remember the trends of good leaving groups in substitution reactions. Good leaving groups are also associated with having a weak carbon bond to the leaving group. So whatever the leaving group is, the bond between the carbon and that leaving group will usually be quite weak. So we talked about this again um, when we talked about bond lengths, for example, um, and how you can weaken that bond. So here we see that just like in our trends for strong acids, remember strong acids, hydrogen fluoride is the weakest of the acids and 
hydrogen iodide, when we look at halides, is the stronger of the acids. So similarly, a alkyl halide with fluorine on it is much weaker than a alkyl halide with iodine on it. So this trend, we actually did talk about this somewhat in the last chapter as well. What you see is that these are also better nucleophiles. Um, they're, they're much better at, excuse me, these are much better electrophiles, not nucleophiles. They're much better at accepting electrons. Um, and so they pair with this strong acid trends. So again, these groups of our alkyl halides or your general electrophile want to be good at accepting electrons, just like strong acids. So what are trends for our nucleophiles? Remember that nucleophiles, nucleophile means nucleus loving. And generally, the most common type of nucleophile you'll see has a lone pair on a, this is key, negative or neutral atom. So for example, dimethyl sulfide, this is a lone pair on a sulfur group. This is a neutral lone pair. And these electrons right here are great as acting as the nucleophile to donate to our electrophile carbon. And notice that it's attached to iodine. We just talked about how this group makes a good electrophile when you have a uh, iodine attached to your carbon. So nucleophilicity, the ability to be a nucleophile, how good of a nucleophile is, is generally a measure of speed. So we compare how good it is at being a nucleophile by how fast it reacts. And generally this tracks with how basic a molecule is. So if it is better at being a base, it's usually better at being a nucleophile. And there are some um, restrictions to that. Generally, across a row in the periodic table, you see that it tracks with how basic something is. So this is going across the row. Down a group, nucleophilicity also increases even though basicity decreases. What I mean is, for example, if you wanted to compare something like this, OH minus to SH minus. If we talked about which one of these was a better base, it would be the hydroxide ion. Hydroxide is a much better base than this sulfide ion. Excuse me, thiol. <clears throat> now, when we're comparing which of these is a better nucleophile, this thiol group is actually a better nucleophile than the hydroxide group. In general, larger and more polarizable anions make better nucleophiles, but they also are less basic. So again, generally, as you go down the periodic table, you see better nucleophilicity. Now the solvation, the solvent that you use in a reaction also plays a role in the nucleophilicity. Smaller anions, things that are smaller, for example, if we wanted to again compare our OH to our SH, OH is a smaller anion is more easily solvated and what happens is it gets shielded from acting as a nucleophile. 
whereas something larger like FH are more difficult to be shielded. It's more difficult, for example, water to solvate, shield molecularly that particular nucleophile, and thus it can act better as a nucleophile because it's not shielded away by the solvent it, it is in. So this is why something that is bigger and more polarizable, although it is a weaker base, tends to act better as a nucleophile because we need it to react faster. Remember that nucleophilicity is about the speed of reaction as a nucleophile. So here are some just general trends you can see for nucleophilicity. Things that are good nucleophiles, again, are going to be big like iodine or sulfur, and they'll have a negative charge on them. So they will be something that has a full negative charge, an ion, um, to react in the reaction. Other good things are still pretty large, and again, they have those full negative charges on them. Um, bromine ion, an OH molecule, um, an OR, that's something like this, right? This is still has that full-blown negative charge on it. Again, remember from the beginning, I said these are usually salts, so you'll see them like this. This, for example, would be a type of RO negative group. Remember that this sodium actually is forming an ionic bond here. So this is a plus charge and this is a minus. Now this is not always written as plus and minus here. You'll have to know to recognize that if you see these metal ions like sodium or potassium, um, for example, you, you know that this is an ionic bond and that that means this has a full negative charge on it. Okay, other things that are okay at being nucleophiles, you can still have like chlorine or fluorine, which have negative charges on them. But remember that as you go up the periodic table um, in the rows themselves, you actually get weaker as shown right here, right? So you get weaker as you go up as far as it being a nucleophile. Um, here also is one of our examples of a neutral molecule that has a lone pair. So the lone pair can still act as a nucleophile. This is um, a type of amine group that would look like this, right? We have NH3 and we have our lone pair on nitrogen. And then things that are weak nucleophiles are things like water or alcohols. Um, and we did actually talk about alcohols as a nucleophile in our past, in our past examples. These act as weak nucleophiles, but they still do, for example, have lone pairs on them that can act. Um, and then something that's a very weak nucleophile is going to be something like a carboxylic acid that would look like this. Right, so there's still lone pairs here, but this is a bit, um, bit unwieldy and it is stabilized by resonance. So it, because of the stabilization, does not act to relinquish its electrons as easily as some of these others with negative charges on them.